Good morning, brothers and sisters, and special welcome and greeting to all guests and visitors worshiping with us on this Lord's Day. The Council has the following announcements. The Council hopes to meet the Lord willing tomorrow evening at 7.30 p.m. in this church building. You are reminded of an opportunity to listen to two recorded speeches from the Canadian Reformed Theological Seminary regarding the relevancy of the Reformation today, the 500th year uh, anniversary of the Reformation. Uh, that's upcoming this Friday evening and more details are in the bulletin. And our offerings today are for the work amongst the needy. So far, the announcements let us lift up our hearts to the Lord. Congregation of the Lord, where does our help come from? Our help is in the name of the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us praise our God together by singing from Psalm 63, stanzas 1 and 2. As we come together as God's people this morning, we turn our attention once again to God's law to see our sins and our shortcomings, but also to find our hope in God's promise of salvation, that though our sins be like scarlet, yet in Christ they are washed whiter than snow if we turn to him in repentance and faith. So let us hear God's law as we find it in Exodus chapter 20, and thereafter let us sing from hymn 3, stanza 5. And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath, or in the waters below. 
You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. The Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our Lord Jesus Christ also summarized God's law for us by teaching us that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let us call upon the Lord in prayer and seek his grace this morning. Our gracious God, our Father who is in heaven, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you in worship and in prayer. We thank you that we may enter into your presence as your children. What an awesome thing that we may be people who are the object of your love and grace. Father, we thank you for sending your Son into this world. If that had not happened, we would still be far away from you. We would be completely unwilling and uninterested and unmotivated and unable to draw near to you. We would still be in our sins. We would be dead in our trespasses and sins and we would be under your short, under your condemnation and without hope in this world and so we thank you for Christ's work of redemption and we confess that in him all our sins are forgiven and removed from your sight and so because of him we may be reconciled to you as our eternal father so that we may have joy and peace and life everlasting 
And Lord, we thank you that you have also entrusted to your people, to the church, the wonderful gift of your Spirit. Lord, we confess that it is only through his empowering and motivating and life-giving work that we could ever decide to come to you. And so we pray that you will give your Spirit generously and abundantly to each and every one of us here this morning. Work in us to receive your word and to respond by faith according to your will. And Lord, we pray that you will also work in the hearts of those who are not here, who chose not to be here this morning. Bring them back into your fold, those who have chosen to stray away from you, choosing instead to follow the desires and the impulses of their own hearts. Will you make them see that life without you is hollow and empty, an illusion that promises life but only delivers death, even ultimately eternal death. And so, Father, rescue their feet from the fire and reunite them to the church of the redeemed, the body of Christ, who is the only and the all-sufficient Savior and Redeemer. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together this morning, the freedom to do so. And we pray for your blessing upon the reading and the proclamation of your word and also upon the administration of the sacrament of the Lord's table. Lord, what a privilege it is for us to hear you speak the living words of life and grace and salvation in the person and in the work of Jesus Christ. And so, Father, nourish and refresh us through the bread and the cup as signs and seals of his broken body and shed blood, broken and shed for our forgiveness. Father, we so desperately need this encouragement of your word and the sacrament. We need this because our faith is not always strong and stable not always flourishing, not always abundantly fruitful. And so we ask you, in all humility, to powerfully accompany the Word and the sacrament so that these might truly be your means of grace to us, so that we may be stable and steadfast, strengthened to carry on until at last we may enter into the joy of your eternal kingdom. Father, give us a most blessed Lord's Day, a day of rest, a day to set aside our anxieties about work and life through the rest of the week, a day of rest of our bodies and our minds, and most of all, a day of resting our lives in the finished work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So hear our prayer, for we ask it in his name. Amen. As we prepare to open and read from God's Word, let us first sing together from Psalm 40, stanzas 2 and 7.
Let us now open and read from God's Word together from the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, and let us read together the first 12 verses. Matthew chapter 5 really is the beginning of Christ's teaching ministry during his earthly life. We will read together Matthew 5 verses 1 through 12 and our text will be found in verse 3. Hear now God's holy and inspired word. Now when he, that is Christ, saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So far our reading of God's word, our text again, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God of heaven. After the proclamation of God's word, we will respond in song by singing from Psalm 73, stanzas 8 and 9. Psalm 73, stanzas 8 and 9, following the sermon. <clears throat> Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, this morning I want to take you to the first section of extended teaching of Christ found in Matthew's Gospel, what is known by the familiar title, the Sermon on the Mount. And this morning we will only dip our toes into it, as it were, giving our attention to only the first 13 words of Christ's sermon, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And over the next number of Lord's Supper Sundays, we will go one by one through the series of Christ's sayings here, which are known as the Beatitudes. Now before we begin to unfold and unpack the meaning and the application of the first Beatitude, it's important for us to understand the nature of the Beatitudes as a whole. What the Beatitudes give us are statements of blessedness, depictions of that perfect happiness, that joy unspeakable and full of glory that belongs to the citizens of God's kingdom. And something to note about all the Beatitudes is that they function as a sort of mirror. Most of us, I imagine checked ourselves in a mirror before coming here this morning to see if we were presentable. For a mirror reflects back to us how we appear. So also the Beatitudes. They give us a portrait, a reflection of, of what we should see. Not so much on the outside, but on the inside those characteristics of heart and life that set the people of God apart from the world, and those in the world. And so the question we must ask as we read through the Beatitudes each time is, 
do I see any of this worked by Christ's Spirit in me and in my life? Is this, by God's grace, a portrait of me? Something else to note is how the Beatitudes turn our natural view of the world upside down. They take what we consider strange and peculiar and perhaps unfortunate and they call those things blessed. Poverty of spirit, mourning, persecution. We would sooner say, blessed are those for whom things are great for whom things turn out swimmingly. But the reality of our world clashes and contrasts sharply with the reality presented by the Beatitudes. And so our Lord here is standing our natural understanding on its head in order to impress upon us the radical and the countercultural idea of what a true Christian ought to look like. And finally, one more thing to note in introduction about the Beatitudes is that they all belong equally and without exception to the profile of a citizen of God's kingdom. And that means that there is no liberty, no freedom granted to us to say, well, I find myself in, in verse 3, but not in verse 7 or vice versa. Or this beatitude is true for others, but it's not true for me. Not so. We cannot pick and choose from this list, but we must weigh ourselves and examine ourselves carefully and honestly in light of each and every one of them. That brings me to the theme then for this morning's sermon, which is, Blessed are the poor in spirit. We'll see first the blessed, secondly the blessing, first the blessed looking at who they are, and secondly the blessing looking at what they receive. First we ask who are they who are poor in spirit? Well right at the outset here let me just say that this is not teaching that there is any particular blessing for poverty just as there is no particular blessing tied to riches, for that matter. In fact, each has its own danger. Give me neither poverty nor riches, says Agur in the book of Proverbs. For if I am poor, I may become envious. But if I am rich, I may become proud, arrogant, haughty, and self-sufficient. Now, as you may know, if you know your Bible well, in Luke's parallel passage of the Beatitudes and much of the teaching on the, of Christ's Sermon on the Mount, the language of this Beatitude is more cryptic there than here in Matthew. There it just says, Blessed are the poor. And the reason for that is probably because in ancient society, poverty and humility went hand in glove, so closely related together. And besides that, God often chooses those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich, to be made rich in faith. But moving back to Matthew then, we see the language used here is blessed are the poor in spirit. So this particular kind of poverty described here is that in the center of our heart, in the core of our being, we all should be beggarly. We must be beggar-like, that is reliant, that is dependent. That's the idea. Everything we have and everything we are is ours only because of God's grace and mercy. It's not because of our perfect record 
or because of our accomplishments or our background or our bank account. No, we confess our poverty of spirit when we, conf- when we acknowledge that apart from the grace of God in Jesus Christ, I am nothing. I have nothing. I bring nothing. All I have is summed up in the broken bread and in the shed blood of the Lord. Now that is a stark confession for us to make. Even in many churches spread across the North American landscape, this grace is underemphasized. But here, in the Reformed Church, a truly Reformed Church will emphasize undeserved grace, unexpected grace, amazing grace, For God has sent us the Lord Jesus Christ, who though he was rich, made himself poor, so that we who are truly poor, through his poverty, would be made rich. That's the glory of the gospel, brothers and sisters. And that's the prime focus and the prime message of the Lord's Supper, of which we may partake later in this service. Our life is only through Christ's death. But this leads us to wonder, how is it possible that through such poverty of spirit, through that kind of honest recognition that the Spirit has worked in our hearts through the Gospel, that I have nothing but what God has given to me through Christ, how does that make me blessed? And that brings us to our second point. Why are the poor in spirit called blessed? Well, Christ answers that saying, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That is, theirs is the deep, deep joy and comfort and peace and contentment of the kingdom, theirs alone. Unlike the healthy who have no need for a doctor, unlike the rich who have no need for what God has to offer them, it is the poor in spirit who know their spiritual poverty, their spiritual bankruptcy before God. It is they who stand in true wonder and amazement at what God has given to them, amazed that He has given them anything at all, no less than the salvation of their souls and and the hope of eternal glory. The kingdom of heaven belongs to them, Do you know what this means, brothers and sisters, for your lives? It means that you cannot have the kingdom without living in true repentance and sorrow over sin. We are about to partake of the Lord's Supper once again, and as we do so, our posture must be one of poverty of spirit. Now I know that this is where people in Reformed churches sometimes face criticism by others who say, you call this meal a meal of celebration? I don't see a lot of joy happening here. Well, there is joy, true joy, but it is a somber and a sobering kind of joy because it was you and I who put Christ on the cross. He paid for your sins and my sins. How? By His death. There's joy there, but it's not the the giddy kind of joy we get when you ride a a roller coaster. It's not frivolous. It's not the pop can kind of fizzy joy. It's, It's a deep, deep joy that we find true life in the one who paid for our sins by suffering under the wrath of God. 
That's the joy that comes only, and I stress, only to the repentant and to the dependent, the poor in spirit. For what was Christ referring to when he spoke of the kingdom of heaven? What did he mean? For I cannot put that in my pocket. I, I don't know how much that kingdom costs. I, I don't know exactly where it's located. Do you? What is it? Well, in a word, it is forgiveness. Forgiveness. He forgives all our sins. He removes them as far as the east is from the west. He throws our sins into the depths of the sea and He blots them out entirely to be seen no more, to be known no more, to weigh against us no more. That's the gift of forgiveness. A beautiful, precious gift. But in giving the gift of forgiveness, let us also remember the other side of that. Too little do we stress the other side of that. For God also gives you the opportunity to forgive. Do you know that? In this regard, think of forgiveness not primarily as a calling and as a command, as an obligation upon us, though it is all of those things. But see forgiveness as an opportunity. An opportunity for the forgiven to enrich and uplift the life of someone else. To shine light into the darkness, uh, blackened darkness of death because of a real offense and because of real wrongdoing that someone else has caused against you. Well, that's forgiveness. That's a powerful, powerful thing. If you know the experience of it in your own life, the forgiveness you have received from God. And so I speak reverently when I say, wouldn't you want to be like God? God in that respect? Showing forgiveness is powerful and beautiful for it enables us to restore joy and grace and fellowship to someone who has lost access to these things. Well, what else does the kingdom consist of? Well, besides forgiveness, we are given a place in the house of the Father. And as a result, we experience a greater love than the love any father or mother, for that matter, has ever shown to their children. And so we have fellowship with God. And by virtue of that, we have fellowship with one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. Furthermore, God adopts us as His own children so that we can approach Him with boldness and without shame, without the shame and guilt of our sin weighing us down. And he also promises us an inheritance kept in heaven for us. And if he keeps that inheritance preserved, then surely he will preserve us so that we can collect that inheritance. Will he not? For it won't do you any good to have a glorious inheritance sitting in store for you, being kept safe and secure, undefiled, if you could not be preserved in order to receive it. But God does both, you see, for you. And we could go on and on describing the kingdom. In short, God promises to be with the citizens of the kingdom, to never leave them, to never forsake them. And so to receive all that, we must see that we are poor and low and needy and empty on our own. But in God's goodness, He has given us Christ, our Savior, who is rich, who is all-sufficient, who alone can meet and fill all of our deepest needs. But there's one more thing that you do not want to miss, though it can 
easily be done so. What I'm speaking of here is one small two-letter word in our text. The word is. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Perhaps you are intrigued by the study of what the Bible says will happen when the world ends and when the new heavens and the new earth are ushered in and instituted. To give you the big theological word for that, that's the topic of eschatology, known also as the doctrine of the last things. It's a great an interesting and fascinating topic, and we spent some time last week Sunday afternoon considering some aspects of this when we gave our attention to Christ's return and our readiness for that day. And one of the things that we know will happen at the end of time is that the church will be greatly blessed for all eternity, and she will experience a great and glorious future. But here in our text, our text is speaking about the present. Theirs is. Not theirs will be one day. So the Christian faith then, and the practice of the Christian faith, is not something we only look forward to with our telescopes so to speak, once we get older, once we near our dying day in a good old age. No, the kingdom of heaven is not something we are waiting for like that off in the distant future, but it is ours now, already. Something we may live for and practice already now. By practicing what? Practicing the kingdom lifestyle and, and, and the attitude that we, that we find our sufficiency in Christ alone. Being able to look back upon every instance where you and I messed up, where we fell into sin, and to see that it is all covered by the blood of Christ. Not because of my accomplishments, but only because Christ has done for me on the cross. The blessing is not found in my success, in my ability, my accomplishments, my upstanding behavior, but my sufficiency is in Christ. So is yours. Take everything else away if you want. You and I have all that we need. In Jesus Christ, with Him, with Him alone, comes your blessing. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Amen.
Let us now proceed to the celebration of the Lord's Supper and let us turn and read together from the form designated for this purpose, the form in the back of our book of praise found on page 603 and following form for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Beloved in our Lord Jesus Christ, it reads, The Holy Supper has been instituted by our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to the words of this institution as described by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians through 29. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. In order that we may now celebrate this Holy Supper of the Lord to our comfort, we must first rightly examine ourselves. Fur further, we must use it as Christ intended it, namely to his remembrance. True self-examination consists of the following three parts. First, let everyone consider his sins and accursedness so that he, detesting himself, may humble himself before God. For the wrath of God against sin is so great that he could not leave it unpunished, but has punished it in his beloved Son, Jesus Christ, by the bitter and shameful death on the cross. Second, let everyone search his heart, whether he also believes the sure promise of God that all his sins are forgiven him only for the sake of the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, and that the perfect righteousness of Christ is freely given him as his own, as if he himself had fulfilled all righteousness. Third, let everyone examine his conscience, whether it is his sincere desire to show true thankfulness to God with his entire life, and laying aside all enmity, hatred, and envy, to live with his neighbor in true love and unity. God will certainly receive in grace all who are thus minded and count them worthy to partake of the supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who do not feel this testimony in their hearts eat and drink judgment upon themselves. Therefore, according to the command of Christ and of the Apostle Paul, we admonish all those who know themselves to be guilty of the following offensive sins to abstain from the table of the Lord. And we declare to them that they have no part in the kingdom of Christ. All who refuse to trust in the Lord alone, or who serve him in their own manner. All who abuse the name of the Lord by cursing or in any other way. All who do not diligently attend the worship services, and who despise the proclamation of God's word or the sanctity of the sacraments. All who are disobedient to their parents, or to, those in, or to others in authority over them, all who violate human life or cherish hatred against their neighbor and refuse to be reconciled to him, all who either within or outside of holy wedlock do not keep their bodies pure, all who by stealing, greed, or extravagance lead a, a worldly life, all liars, backbiters, and slanderers, briefly, all who either in word or conduct show themselves to be unbelieving by leading an offensive life. While they persist in their sins, they shall not take of this food which Christ has ordained only for his believers, otherwise their judgment and condemnation will be the heavier. 
But all this, beloved brothers and sisters, is not meant to discourage broken and contrite hearts, as if only those who are without sin may come to the table of the Lord. For we do not come to this supper to declare that we are perfect and righteous in ourselves. On the contrary, we seek our life outside of ourselves in Jesus Christ, and in doing so we acknowledge that we are dead in ourselves. We also are aware of our many sins and shortcomings. We do not have perfect faith, and we do not serve God with such zeal as he requires. Daily we have to contend with the weakness of our faith and with the evil desires of our flesh. Yet, by the grace of the Holy Spirit, we are heartily sorry for these shortcomings and desire to fight against our unbelief and to live according to all the commandments of God. Therefore, we may be fully assured that no sin or weakness which still remains in us against our will can prevent us from being received by God in grace and from being made worthy partakers of this heavenly food and drink. Let us now consider for what purpose the Lord has instituted his supper, namely, that we should use it in remembrance of him. We are to remember him in the following manner. First of all, let us fully trust that the Lord Jesus Christ was sent by the Father into this world according to the promises made from the beginning to the fathers in the Old Testament and that he assumed our flesh and blood. From the beginning of his incarnation to the end of his life on earth, he bore for us the wrath of God under which we should have perished eternally. By his perfect, perfect obedience, he has for us fulfilled all the righteousness of God's law. We remember in particular the weight of the wrath of God caused by our sins pressed out of him sweat like drops of blood falling on the ground in the garden of Gethsemane. There he was bound that he might free us from our sins. He suffered countless insults that we might never be put to shame. Though innocent, he was condemned to death, that we might be acquitted at the judgment seat of God. He even let his blessed body be nailed to the cross, that he might cancel the bond which stood against us because of our sins. By all this, he has taken our curse upon himself, that he might fill us with his blessing. On the cross, he humbled himself in body and soul to the very deepest shame and and anguish of hell. Then he called out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That we might be accepted by God and never more be forsaken by him. Finally, by his death and the shedding of his blood, he confirmed the new and eternal testament, the covenant of grace, when he said, It is finished. In order that we might firmly believe that we belong to this covenant of grace, the Lord Jesus Christ, during his last Passover, instituted the Holy Supper. He gave the bread and the cup to his disciples in remembrance of him. He taught us to understand that as often as we eat this bread and drink from this cup, we are reminded and assured of his hearty love and faithfulness towards us. It is a sure pledge that he has given his body and shed his blood for us. Otherwise, we would have suffered eternal death. He nourishes and refreshes our hungry and thirsty souls with his crucified body and shed blood to everlasting life, as certainly as this bread is broken before our eyes and this cup is given to us and we eat and drink in remembrance of him. From this institution of the Holy Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ, we learn that he directs our faith and trust to his perfect sacrifice once offered on the cross. It is the only ground uh, for our salvation. Thereby he has become to our hungry and thirsty souls the true food and drink of life eternal. For by his death, He has removed the cause of our eternal hunger and misery, which is sin, and obtained for us the life-giving Spirit. By this Spirit, who dwells in Christ as the head and in us as his members, 
we have true communion with him and share in all his riches, life eternal, righteousness, and glory. By the same Spirit, we are also united in true brotherly love as members of one body. For the Apostle Paul says, Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. As one bread is baked out of many grains and one wine is pressed out of many grapes, so we all, incorporated in Christ by faith, are together one body. For the sake of Christ, who so exceedingly loved us first, we shall now love one another and shall show this to one another, not just in words, but also in deeds. Finally, Christ has commanded us to celebrate the Holy Supper until he comes. We receive at his table a foretaste of the abundant joy which he has promised and look forward to the marriage feast of the Lamb when he will drink the wine new with us in the kingdom of his Father. Let us rejoice and give him the glory for the marriage feast of the Lamb is coming. May the Almighty, Heavenly God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ help us in this through his Holy Spirit. Amen. To receive all this, let us now humble ourselves before God in prayer and call upon him in true faith. Merciful God and Father, we thank you that in this supper we cherish the blessed memory of the bitter death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ. Work in our hearts through the Holy Spirit so that we may entrust ourselves more and more to your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that our contrite hearts may be nourished with his true body and blood. Yes, with him who is the only heavenly bread, that we may not live in our sins, but Christ in us and we in him. Let us so truly be partakers of the new and everlasting testament, the covenant of grace, that we do not doubt that you will forever be our gracious Father, never more imputing to us our sins, but providing us with all things for body and soul as your dear children and heirs. Grant us your grace that we may take up our cross joyfully, deny ourselves, and confess our Savior. Let us in all tribulation await our Lord Jesus Christ, who will come from heaven to change our mortal body, to be like his glorious body, and take us to himself forever. Hear us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us now profess our Catholic and undoubted Christian faith by singing together the Apostles' Creed as we find it in him one.
Brothers and sisters, in order that we may now be nourished with Christ, the true heavenly bread, we must not cling with our hearts to the outward symbols of bread and wine, but lift our hearts on high in heaven where Christ, our advocate, is at the right hand of his heavenly Father. Let us not doubt that we shall be nourished and refreshed in our souls with his body and blood, through the working of the Holy Spirit, as truly as we receive the holy bread and drink in remembrance of him. We now invite all communicant members in good standing to participate, and we are reminded once again that at the center of the wine tray is grape juice for those who have requested it. Let us now sing as the table is prepared from hymn 59, both stanzas.
communion of the body uh, of the body of Christ. Take, eat, remember, and believe that the body of our Lord Jesus Christ was broken for the complete forgiveness of all our sins. The cup of blessing for which we give thanks is the communion of the blood of Christ. Take, drink from it, all of you. Remember and believe that the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ was poured out for the complete forgiveness of all our sins.
together now at this table sing from Psalm 63, stanza 3. Beloved in the Lord, since the Lord has now nourished our souls at his table, let us together praise his holy name. Let everyone say in his heart, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity who heals all your diseases and who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. Therefore my heart and my mouth shall proclaim the praise of the Lord from now on and forevermore. Amen. In our thanksgiving prayer, also our congregational prayer this morning, we will, we will remember those in our midst who are you know, suffering from injuries and uh, for instance, two uh, recent falls. Um, our sister, Buca Vanderveen, suffered a fall and a broken arm as a result. And also our sister, Helen Jissink, also experienced a fall 
in um, recent uh, days, recent in the recent months, some time. And we will also give thanks, together with our brother John Weymacamp, uh, about a good report that shows no signs of a return of cancer. So we will remember these matters and these individuals also in prayer. Let us pray. Merciful God and Father, we thank you that in your boundless mercy you have given us your only begotten Son as our mediator. We praise you that he is the sacrifice for our sins and our food and drink to life eternal. We thank you that you give us a true faith through which we may share in such great benefits. Through your Son, you have instituted the Holy Supper for the strengthening of our faith. We earnestly ask you, faithful God and Father, that by your Holy Spirit, this celebration may lead to our daily increase in true faith and fellowship with Christ, your beloved Son. Father in heaven, we thank you for the identity that you give us by grace in Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gospel which calls and encourages us to be poor in spirit. Father, help us to recognize our poverty in this regard, our sins and misery, to see them, to repent over them, to see our beggarly condition at the foot of the cross where we all stand on equal ground, level ground. For when we see our beggarly condition, our poverty of spirit, for then and then only are we in a position to celebrate the great kingdom that you have established and promised to give us, where you give us forgiveness, where you give us fellowship with you and with one another, and also a hopeful future. And so we thank you for the encouragement you provide through word and sacrament that enables us to deal with and be comforted through the challenges of life as we live not by sight, but by faith in Christ. Lord, as we look back on the week gone by, we can see once again your love and care that you showed to us at every moment. You were constantly with us. You were there to provide. You were there to protect. You were there to guide. You were there to comfort. You proved to us once again that you never fail or forsake your beloved children. Lord, you are there not only in happy days when things, when everything is going smoothly and soundly and when we feel cheerful, but you are also there in difficult times when we feel burdened, when we suffer, when the circumstances of our lives prove challenging for us. Indeed, O oh Lord, when we are at our weakest, then your grace and power are more clearly and abundantly evident in our lives. And so, Father, be with those who are suffering and ailing in different ways. In particular, be with our sister, Buca Vanderveen, that she may be given healing and recuperation from the recent injury that she endured give to her all that she needs to deal with all the, the changes that she has undergone in the past few weeks and also wisdom to make the choices that lie ahead of her. Give her, we pray, a great measure of your strength and spirit. Be, Lord, also with our sister Helen Jessink. Grant to her also relief from suffering and discomfort caused by a fall Give her patience, and if it be your will, give her healing and help her to look to you for the strength that she needs to go on from day to day in your service. At the same time, Father, we give you thanks for the good report of, that our brother John Weymacamp could receive regarding his health. We thank you for the news that the cancer has not returned. Lord, how we are reminded also through this that every day that you give us is a precious gift. And so help John and help us all to see your hand of blessing extended toward each of us and help us to reflect a spirit of true Christian thankfulness for all that you have bestowed upon us. So then accept our prayer and the thanksgiving offerings that we bring before you now 
receive them and use them for your glory and for the advancement of your kingdom, so to bring blessing to those who are in need. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord now gives you opportunity to bring your offerings of thankfulness to him. And after the offering has been collected, let us sing in closing from Psalm 84, stanza 6. Lift up your hearts and receive now the Lord's blessing. 
The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen.